Hey, Sarah here, really privileged to bring you some thoughts around a parable of Jesus today. But before I get there, I was reading uh, this week kind of a bit of a, an illustration of some prayers that children had written to God. So let me read these out to you. Some of them are humorous, some of them are poignant, some of them are simply very sweet, some of them are quite searching. But I love the fact that there's a variety of ways that these children are approaching God. So, dear God, I didn't think orange went with purple until I saw the sunset you made on Tuesday. It was cool. I like that one. Or instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you keep the ones you already have? Oh, that's very poignant, isn't it? Maybe Cain and Abel would not have killed each other if they had their own rooms. That's what my mum did for me and my brother. If you watch me in church on Sunday, God, I'll show you my new shoes. I love that one. How about this prayer? I bet it's very hard to love everyone in the whole world. There are only four people in our family and I'm having a hard time loving all of them. This one is great because, well, let's be honest, you might have wondered this too. Did you mean for the giraffe to look like that or was it an accident? And then this one. Please help me in school. I need help in spelling, adding history, geography and writing. I don't need help in anything else. Now, the reason I've shared these with us today is yes, some of them are humorous and some of them are poignant, but the story with the meaning, the parable that I'm sharing with you today was about approaches to God in prayer. It's a story that Jesus told and in this story, both men approach God, both men pray to God, but their approach is very, very different. So we're going to look at Luke and um, chapter 18 and just read together 9 to 14, just a short little parable. And this is Jesus speaking and the context of it. Verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I'll give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So just a really kind of short story here, but I think it's quite clear that Jesus is trying to get people's attention. So let's think about some of the characters in this parable. There's a Pharisee and a tax collector and they're all praying to God. Now a Pharisee in those days was a member of kind of a religious order, a religious kind of grouping within Jewish faith. They were known for their strictest adherence to the letter of the law and they were quite well respected in their society they were to be admired. And then we've got this tax collector. Now the tax collectors, imagine the villain at the pantomime, boo, hiss. They are seen as collaborators with the Roman occupying force and they are the opposite in society to someone like a Pharisee. They're not regarded very highly at all. But, but Jesus, I think, is trying to show us that there's a way that we can approach God in prayer and maybe there's a way not to approach God in prayer. I think he's probably trying to get us to understand that he came with a new way to know God and to have a relationship with him. That it isn't about the external, how you appear, whether you've got it all together, whether you're the highest in society or the lowest in society. It isn't about the external show, but the inner transformation, the attitude of the heart that comes to God. It's not about appearing right on the inside, on the outside, sorry, but about coming to God humbly on the inside. It's about everyone being welcome to know God and communicate with God. And the, the words here tell us that the people that Jesus is addressing primarily is to those who were confident of their own righteousness and they looked down on everyone else. The ones who were supposed to know how to pray, the ones who prayed regularly in public, maybe even the ones who taught others to pray. But there would have been another audience there that day, disciples or potential followers of Jesus. And perhaps they look at these religious leaders, they look at other people praying, go, I'll never be able to pray like that. God wouldn't even hear me if I can't put the words together. Maybe I'm not as good a person as that one. What if I say it wrong? And I really believe Jesus is trying to, you know, get to a misconception about prayer 
that it's about performance when actually prayer is incredibly personal and it's about relationship, conversing with God, listening to God, talking with God, sharing what's on our hearts, being authentic before God. Let me read this list of what prayer can be. Listening to God's direction, applying his divine wisdom, receiving Father's affirmation, wrestling with doubts and disappointments, enjoying his love, understanding his word, crying out for change, bringing others' needs in petition, asking for holy interventions, conversing and communing with God. You see, Jesus' close followers, his disciples, they grew up around this kind of Pharisee praying. But they saw something different in the way that Jesus prayed. And he's continuing that teaching with this parable, this story with a meaning. He's saying, look, don't pray to be seen. Don't worry about praying big, long, showy words. How you come before God, how you're approaching is so much more important. And, you know, when the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. The only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them. He starts in Luke 11, we, we see it there, what we really know as the Lord's Prayer, but he starts with these two words, our Father. Maybe we've treated the Lord's Prayer like a formula when actually it's that invitation into the life of prayer that Jesus had with the Father, which is so incredible. Our Father, he says, you can know God as Father. So I want us to think about two things that we might take away from this parable. Firstly, I think there's a picture of self-confidence versus God-confidence. And then I think there's a picture of performance versus authenticity. So self-confidence then is your, your ability, your striving, your uh, kind of cap capability or capacity, you keeping up standards of righteousness. And the Pharisee is misdirecting his passion for God and it's come out as self-righteousness and self confidence, relying on self to earn God's approval and measuring himself against his own standards. He's like, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, tax collectors. I fast. In this short prayer, he says the word I five times. There's a self-confidence that comes from that. And what does it lead to? This sense of superiority, of pride, and of a false sense of security. You know, the wonder of grace and relationship with God is that it's based on who Jesus is, on what he's done for us. He loves us not because of what we do, but because of who he is. And his love is unconditional towards us. And we can approach God in prayer because Jesus has made a way for us. In fact, one of my favorite verses, the, the sentences from the Bible, is found in Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let me read it for you. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is God confidence, not self-confidence, that we can come boldly to God, the highest authority in the land, knowing that we're welcome, knowing that we can approach and knowing that in prayer there's this exchange. We bring our requests and our mess and our reality. And in exchange, God gives us his help and his mercy and his grace. Wow. This reality gives us confidence that whatever is going on in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our circumstances, that we can approach God confidently. Not in our own righteousness or our own self, but humbly and boldly. There's this paradox that exists in the kingdom of God, that we can come humbly knowing that we're coming to an awesome, powerful, amazing God, the God of the universe, who wants to commune with you and me, but that also we can come boldly. So why can we come boldly? Well, there's lots of reasons, but I think one of them that I'd love us to think about today is we come boldly because we're invited. You know, this picture of a throne of grace is of uh, you know, the highest authority in the land, the king or the queen, the kind of ruling authority, the sovereign. And in ancient times and even today, if you want to get before a sovereign over a land, before a king or a queen, you need to be invited into the presence or you need to be a family member with easy access. The reality is that you and I are invited. We're sons and daughters of the living God. And we said yes to Jesus and we've given our life to Jesus and we're following after him. We are welcome to come boldly yet humbly before God with all the things that are in our lives and in our hearts. Because the foundation for this boldness is not in and of ourselves or our own ability, 
but in God, in what Jesus has done for us. He has made a way. No one comes to the Father except through him, and he's the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, he's bridged the gap, he's bridged that divide, so you and I can come boldly, directly to God for ourselves. The Pharisee relied on his own power, but the tax collector relied on the mercy and grace of God. So we've got self-confidence versus God confidence, and then we've got this performance versus authenticity. And it's been my experience, uh, I've been involved in leading prayer for 20 years or so. I know I don't look it, but thanks. Uh, you know, I've been involved in leadership and ministry for a long time. And, and over the years, honestly, I've discovered the best way to come to God is authentically. The tax collector knew his place in society, he stood at a distance, a far off, and he's beating his breast. It's this idea of continually going, God, I'm a sinner. God, have mercy on me. He's not putting on ears and graces. He's not trying to be something he's not. See, the Pharisee thought he was better than he was, but I think the tax collector probably thinks he's worse than he is. And whichever one of those we most identify with, God says for us to come to him authentically. The humble and authentic approach gained God's attention and response. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I believe God responds to our humble and authentic cries for help. You know, a number of years ago, um, Mother's Day was actually on a Sunday and uh, I was getting ready to, to share and to speak at the church I'm part of in North Birmingham, Elam Life Church. And um, I get a phone call, my mum has been rushed into hospital. They don't know what's wrong with her. She's in a, an intensive care unit. So my family live in Wales. I jump in the car, my friend drives me because I'm in no state to drive. I get into the hospital and it's in one of those wards that is, you know, dark lighting, uh, a couple of nurses to each bed, very quiet, very still. And I realise this is quite serious. And uh, the consultant takes us into a room, a family room, and says, look, we've taken a scan, here's the scan, there's a blood clot on your mum's brain. Now, if we don't operate, it could burst and that might cause death, but if we do operate, there's still a chance uh, of death or even of kind of complications. So we're left with an impossible choice, and honestly, in those moments, I didn't know what to pray. My prayer, very simply, was help. Lord, help. They left her for a little while to see if anything would change. They started to think about when they would do surgery and then they took another scan and they invited us back into the room. In the meantime, my best friend had traveled and we sat around my mum's bedside and my friend very simply prayed, God, would you heal her? And as we're in that room waiting to see what's gonna happen next, there's some good news. They can't now see the blood clot. <laughs> They can't see uh, any kind of signs of this. She had collapsed earlier in the day and, and now suddenly there's no signs of anything. And I honestly believe that God heard that very simple but authentic cry for help. You know, Jesus was saying to the people who were listening, the people who thought so much of themselves and perhaps the people who thought little of themselves, come humbly, boldly, authentically before God. You don't have to put on a performance. You don't have to have all the right words. In fact, Jesus in another place in the Bible says, don't keep babbling on. God wants to hear our hearts. It's wonderful that God has created this thing called prayer. That means we can approach God when things go right, when things go wrong, in triumphs and tragedies. God says we can approach him humbly. You know, I'm inspired by the way that Jesus modeled his prayers. He didn't use complicated words or long-winded sentences. He's very simple, very direct. He prayed on mountaintops. He prayed by the side of lakes. He prayed in religious buildings. He prayed in a garden. He prayed late at night. He prayed early in the morning. He prayed on his own. He prayed with his friends. You know, there may be different places that feel more authentic to you to be able to connect with God in a personal way. You might find walking or being somewhere out in nature really helps you. You might be like me, I love the sensory, the fairy lights, the coffee, the music, the journal, the Bible. Or perhaps you need silence and solitude. Whichever way you best meet with God, be really intentional about it. I want to encourage you that prayer is as vital to our spiritual life as breathing is to our natural life. 
And when we view prayer as something we do, we might get bored. But when we view prayer as this incredible invitation to know God, to come and say, hey, I've messed up, to come and say, God, would you celebrate in this victory with me? To come and say, God, I don't know what to do, would you help me? To come and say, God, I'm reading this thing called the Bible, could you give me some insight? However we pray, to come to him, not with performance, but authentically, to come not with self-confidence, but with God confidence. Let's be ourselves and be authentic. Let's be God confident. And as I finish up, I wanna read these words from the, the message paraphrase of Matthew 6 and verse seven. It says this, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. As you read again and think about this parable, this story with a meaning, may you be inspired to come humbly before God, to come boldly before God, and to come regularly into that place of connecting with him in prayer. He's your father, he knows better than you what you need. May you encounter him more deeply. Amen.